I would like to talk about my vision, which is to build homes on Mars using some unorthodox methods. Um, and uh, these methods uh, have taken me down a journey of um, some, some crazy concepts, which have taken me down like a path uh, which have resulted in uh, a technology which could potentially have a lot of positive impact on the world. So this story starts in 2017. I just finished my PhD. Uh, it was a total disaster. I nearly failed it several times, but I managed to get through. And then uh, I decided I'll give science another go, and I rolled the dice again. I decided to do a completely different project, uh, and I must have rolled a double six because I landed here in Manchester. And the project was very interesting. So it is making uh, spider silk fibers through a biosynthetic way. So basically trying to make spider silk, which is a very strong, tough material inside a laboratory. Uh, because farming spiders for their silk is very difficult and creepy. So if we can make them in the lab, it'd be a lot better. Um, so it was really interesting. Unfortunately, it didn't work at all. So it was a bit of a disaster again. But um, yeah, it was all very interesting. And rather than give up, we decided to pivot. So rather than make fiddly spider silk fibers, which are very annoying, we decided to make a spider silk glue. So spiders make up to seven different types of, of silk, and some of these are like sticky glues. So we decided, let's make a glue instead, uh, because it's much easier to make and test a glue. And this actually worked. So um, we decided we'll write this up as a scientific uh, article and get it published. Um, and one of our last experiments, we decided to just test a random protein just to get like a baseline stickiness. And I just grabbed the first protein off the shelf, which just happened to be from cow's blood. Uh, and when I did the test, we were expecting it to be much less sticky than our fancy engineered spider silk glue. But to our surprise, it was actually much stronger. So our initial reaction was, this is a disaster. We spent months carefully designing and, and engineering this fancy spider silk protein. And it's just been blown out of the water by literally the cheapest protein you can buy off the shelf. But then uh, once the dust has settled, we we thought about it and we figured actually it's quite interesting and our goal was to produce a protein-based glue as an alternative to synthetic oil drive adhesive. So it was a good thing actually that we'd found a cheap, common, off-the-shelf protein that was significantly stronger than you know, a much more expensive and difficult to produce engineered one. So we got this published and that was great. Um, and then we thought, where else can we go with this? Because it's quite interesting. And one thing we noticed was this spider silk, uh, sorry, this cow blood protein was particularly good at sticking glass together. So we thought if we can stick glass together, it would also be able to stick sand together because glass and sand are, are chemically the same, silicon dioxide, your glass is made out of sand. Um, so we figured if we take this cow blood protein, mix it with sand, we should be able to make a material that is a bit like concrete. So in concrete, you have cement as a binder to, for sand and aggregate. In this case, we have the cowboy glue as the binder. Uh, and this worked. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't that interesting because it was basically worse in every way for normal concrete. So it's more expensive, less sustainable, less ethical. Uh, and I don't think the cows are too happy about it either. Um, but then I was watching a tech talk one day and the speaker mentioned that Mars dust is also about 50% sand. So I thought, if, if this cow blood glue can stick together normal sand, it should be able to stick together Mars dust as well to make like a concrete on Mars. And this is much more interesting because one, Mars. Two, if we're gonna send humans to Mars, we're gonna to have to make a lot of concrete to shield them from space radiation and solar flares. Um, and three, normal concrete isn't an option. So it's very cheap on Earth, but on Mars, it's basically, you know, there's no shops that sell it, there's no infrastructure that produces it. So we need to find a different alternative to concrete on Mars. And researchers have been trying to do this for decades now without much success. So our proposal was to take <laughs> a cow to space, um, occasionally have it donate blood, take the protein, turn it into glue, mix it with the Mars dust, and we've got our Mars uh, bioconcrete. Um, unfortunately, it's neither practical nor wise to take a cow to Mars. So if you can imagine a cow running around in your space habitat, it makes taking a cow a bull to a china shop seem like a good idea in comparison. Um, however, we are going to take humans anyway to Mars, and we have blood, so we thought, could we use an equivalent blood protein from, from humans rather than have to take the cows? And humans have a much better temperament than, than cows, so we're not going to cause all these problems. 
So we did this experiment and we found it worked. You can use a protein from human blood to stick together Mars dust to make bioconcrete on Mars. And the other really interesting we found is when we were investigating the mechanism, we found a compound called urea um, could actually make the concrete 50% stronger. And you get urea from urine. It's the, it's the, it's the second most common co component in urine after water. So we could make a material that was as strong as normal concrete just with human blood, ure urine, and Mars dust, which was great. And um, unfortunately, there's a couple of problems with this idea. So no one really wants to live in houses made of their own scabs and urine. And it's also not ethical to like farm humans for their blood to make concrete. So that was a bit of a write-off. So what we did was we looked to uh, the historical literature to see what humans used to use as glues in the past. And one thing that kept coming up was horses. So we sent horses to glue factories to turn to glue. And what we do is we take their skins and their other collagen-rich tissues, boil and render it down and make a glue. So we thought, why don't we do this on Mars instead? You know, make a glue, mix it with Mars dust, then we've got our bioconcrete. We've already established that it's unwise to take large animals to Mars, like horses or cows, but we're gonna take humans anyway, and we have lots of skin. So my idea was, why don't we use human skin to make a glue? Um, so before anyone calls the police on me, uh, I'm not suggesting we peel off people's skin, that's not gonna be sustainable or ethical, but what I was suggesting is we use the skin we shed naturally, or maybe with a bit of abrasion, so we call it corn screen. But seriously, every person here today will shed one gram of skin per day. It just comes off as dandruff, comes off as dust. On Earth, it doesn't matter, just falls to the ground, who cares? But if you are on an enclosed habitat, like a Mars, like a, a Mars habitat, that skin that comes off as dust and dandruff will accumulate in the air filtration filters. So we have to clean those anyway. So it's just a free source of skin, one gram per person per day. We might as well do something with it, and we're gonna to have to recycle it in some way. So my suggestion is uh, make a glue out of it. Um, but unfortunately, one gram per person per day just isn't enough because we need to make so much concrete. We need meters thick walls and ceilings in our habitat. So unfortunately, it's not gonna work by itself. So we went back to the history books to see what else we used to use as glue. And it turned out all throughout history, even up until World War II, we used to use a protein from cheese as a glue. So there was airplanes in World War II that had like the wooden components stuck together with cheese glue, essentially. So we figured if we just take a cow to space, we can, it can keep its blood and we milk it, we, turn, we get the cheese, we turn that into a, a glue, mix it with Mars dust. And by the way, we call this mooncrete with an emphasis on the moo. Uh, mainly to resonate with the, the folk tales, you know, the cow jumped over the moon, the moon is made out of cheese. So we thought that was quite nice. Um, and I know what you're thinking, yes, technically humans are mammals, but no, I didn't go there, so I'm not that mad. Um, so then this left us in a bit of a sticky situation. We didn't really have any viable options to make glue out of humans. So we thought, is there anything else we produce, that humans produce, that is sticky, uh, that preferably we would produce ourselves, you know, like, it's not going to harm us to produce. Um, and then one day, it came to me, uh, Eureka. Um, we call this material cement with an S. S-E-M-E-N-T, cement. And obviously, it uses snot. Human, the S stands for snot, mucus, because your snot is a ball to capture dust. It's sticky. To, to stop dust going to your lungs, so it's the ideal, it's literally evolved to stick dust, so it's the perfect material. Um, but unfortunately, NASA didn't like that idea either, so that was, wasn't great. Um, so then we thought, gosh, let's start thinking outside the box. Does, it, does the glue have to come from the human? Maybe, rather than take something from us to make a glue, we could consider what we put into ourselves and make that into a glue. So what I mean by that is, if we're going to send humans to Mars, we're going to have to feed them, right? So we thought, can we make some kind of glue out of the food that we're going to produce to feed the, the astronauts anyway? And that would just literally cut out the middleman and save all those problems. Um, so I was thinking about it, I was doing some research, and it turned out the answer was in front of me this whole time. In fact, I've been eating it every day, and the clue was glue. No, I wasn't eating glue. What I mean is the clue was the word glue. So the word glue comes, the, comes from gluten, 
and it comes from gluten because we, we can make a glue from, from gluten, so the, the flour from wheat, essentially. If you add water, heat it, and mix it, it makes a sticky glue. And that was the origin, the common origin of the word glue and gluten. So, um, yeah, basically, we made this wheat paste, gluten paste. We can mix it with Marsus, and we could make like a brick. So that was a much more feasible and ethical way to make our bioconcrete. Not only that, but we found that you can also make a glue from starch. Uh, so again, historically, um, humans used to take things like potatoes, cassava, rice, uh, and take the starch as it was just the white part of it. It's, it's basically just carbohydrate, and, and they chew it in their mouths, and there's an enzyme in their spit that would activate the starch. It would chop up the starch and turn it into a glue. So we thought, we can do this as well. We're going to have to feed the humans. So uh, you know, if we're going to feed them rice or potatoes, why not make a glue out of starch and use that as the binder to stick together the Mars dust to make our bioconcrete. And this works, so we call it starcrete or starch concrete. It works really well, it's actually twice as strong as ordinary concrete, and all there is to it is Mars dust, starch, water, which we can recover, so we can use that again, and a pinch of salt, which we can get for the Martian environment, and just a dash of human spit for that enzymatic effect. And um, the spit is optional though, so it's not, not fully required, although it'd be good if it, if it was. Um, but at this point, it was 2019, things came crashing back down to earth, um, COVID hit, and I was locked out of my lab uh, in lockdown, so I did what any self-respecting mad scientist would do, and that was to set up an underground laboratory in my cellar. Uh, and here, I carried on experimenting, but with huge constraints. You know, I didn't have access to labs, proper resources, so I resorted to mixing things I had, like brick dust, and waste plaster powder and literally kitchen covered ingredients like vinegar and baking soda. And in doing so, with these constraints, I developed a process and a material to make something that looks and feels like a ceramic tile, but hadn't been fired, so at a much lower carbon footprint. Uh, we called this first one Farberlith because as well as uh, chalk dust, which is the mineral component, the binder was basically the gross water you pour away when you open a can of chickpeas. Vegans call this aquafaba. Uh, bean water, um, and the justification was vegans use it as an egg white substitute, and egg whites can be used as a binder, and egg whites is a good substitute for blood if you don't have blood as the binder, so that's how we came onto that. But suddenly it became a lot more feasible for application on Earth. And then another experiment, um, basically I kept seeing you know, all this wasted leaves and grass clippings, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could make a material out of waste leaves? Um, so I extracted the chlorophyll, and I processed that, and I turned it, it turned out you can make a glue out of chlorophyll and use it as a binder to stick together stuff to make a ceramic-like material. Uh, this was like version one, and then ultimately you developed it to make a material called Sialith, which uses a blue version of chlorophyll called uh, phycocyanin. And this is interesting because um, this blue version of chlorophyll is produced by algae, and it's a significant byproduct from algae biomanufacturing and third-generation biofuels production. So if you're growing algae to make biodiesel, taking sunlight, carbon dioxide, uh, and water to make biodiesel. Um, this phycocyanin is a significant waste product, so we found we can use that and add value to it by turning it into a, um, into a ceramic tile alternative. Again, hasn't been fired, so it's a much lower carbon footprint. And then lastly, uh, we developed another material called Erith. This is the most promising one. Um, this one uses waste gypsum plaster, so plasterboard as the inorganic component, which is over 98% of the material, so very high recycle content. And then another secret binder. Don't worry, it's not based on humans, it's all plant-based, uh, very low cost and sustainable. So we figured this uh, process and this technology, it's, it's almost too good to just publish in, in, science, in scientific literature and just have no one apply it. So I decided to take the plunge and go on the startup journey, starting in my cellar, and then after raising some investment, uh, we now have a small railway arch in Manchester where we continue to develop and optimize and scale up the materials. And we're at the process now where we're trying to, yeah, scale up the process. So we have, we've demonstrated it on the small scale and now we're trying to um, apply this technology and license the technology to established ceramic tile producers so they can make ceramic-like materials without having their kilns on, saving a lot of the gas and, um, yeah, saving the costs and saving CO2 emissions. So thanks very much for listening. That's the end of my talk. And I guess the take-home message is, uh, 
I was worried that was going to happen, but I'm just going to finish with a couple of take-home messages. Um, I think the lessons here are sometimes challenges and constraints and adversity aren't necessarily a bad thing. You know, if I hadn't nearly failed my PhD, I would never have gone down this path. If I wasn't thinking about the challenges and constraints of living on Mars, I never would have explored the, the blood bioconcrete, which took me down the path to something plant-based, more sustainable. And if it wasn't for the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I wouldn't have been forced to think outside the box and develop, you know, use like waste materials and literally kitchen grub ingredients, which ultimately made the, the materials and processes sustainable and scalable. Thanks very much for listening.